start off today, uh, opposed to these office hours, raise your hand if n neither of those works for you and you have t time conflicts. Yeah? Okay, great. Okay, so Tuesday, 1.10 to 2, is it exclusively this class, and then Friday, Thursday, 10 to, 10 to 11 is um, my other class that I'm teaching right now could, might come in too, so it'll be, that's more uh, open. So if you, well, Strictly be MA 223, and then I'll see how things flow on Thursdays with the two classes coming in, or different people coming in. You just have to wait some. And uh, if you can't make it, um, my you can check my calendar and send me an email and ask to meet me other, at other times. Um, there's a possibility, too. Um, how's it going? How's homeworks and stuff? Working on working on the problems. Did everybody complete chapter one problems? Anybody not complete it? Yeah, having trouble or just doing other things? Yeah. How many have started chapter two? One. So we're gonna we're uh, gonna get through two point uh, four or five today, maybe six. Forget. So you want to start moving on those, uh, getting into cha in a chapter two problem set. And I have the problem sets. Um, if you click the schedule, and I don't know, if, just to make sure this is all clear to everybody too, I'm, I'm going to post the notes, the notebooks, and probably in the videos too. Hopefully, I just haven't got, gotten that uh, done. The videos are available to view on Canvas, though. There's a page on Canvas that you can click and view, and they put them up instantly, or right after class. And then I have some suggested problem sets right here. So problem set two is from chapter two. You need to be working on those. Um, and then somebody asked me on Piazza whether I'm going to post solutions. Um, I'm teaching two new, essentially two new classes this quarter, so I'm very stretched for time. And I'm writing a book for the other class, which is, makes it even worse. <laughs> but... Uh, I may or may not. I think I have solutions that I can dig up. So I'll, I'll see if I can find the ones that already exist. I'll definitely post them or make them available to you all. If I can't, um, we're going to likely just have to uh, talk about the ones you're struggling with. Okay? So that's, a be that's the best I'm going to be able to do with my, my time resources this quarter. Is that okay or very disappointing? Or um, The answers are in the, in the book, though, right? So you can, you got a target, and you got your neighbors to talk about, and somebody in the class is going to get to the target. So be sure to ask questions on Piazza and help answer them if you know what's going on. Uh, the next thing I want to do is, um, <clears throat> so I have October 16th is next week, right? Uh, mo Monday, October 16th, next Monday, a week from today. I've got this project proposal due. And if you read pro the project portion here, it sort of explains what this is all about. But in, in, essentially, you need to write me a few pages um, proposing what you would like to do for your project. Okay? And it should explain, you should have a little bit of literature, look, you know, looking up some literature related to it. And you should also. Um, Talk about like, you know, what kind of how many rigid bodies might be in the system? What what coordinates might describe them? Uh, so you know, and then what kind of question you might want to answer, right? Or or specs, but probably it's going to be a sort of a research question. What are the what's what's some kind of question that you want to use that model to answer? Okay. So that I have do next Monday. Let me think about this, and then the uh, Monday, and then we'll do our first exam on the 30th, so that's one week, two weeks. I, I'll, I'll, I may push that back. I'll, I'll think about that. It seems a little quick. But let's take a couple of minutes, chat with whoever's beside you, tell them, you know, give them a, a two-minute pitch on 
what you might be thinking about in terms of a project and see if you can describe it to them and vice versa uh, just to get some get some thought if you haven't thought of anything um, you know ask ask each other for ideas like what you know and then I'll, and I'll come around and listen in a little and chat okay so take let's take uh, let's take about five to eight minutes or something and uh, chat chat with your neighbor and that, do we have pairs? I think we've got an odd, odd number in here. So one group of three or something. All right. So scoot together. Talk to your neighbors. Meet them. Tell them what you're thinking about you might do. At a foot? <laughs> yeah. For a robot or a human or, a, or an animal? You know. So you want to do something with walking or running or jumping? Cool. Yeah. I've got a good uh, long jump paper that, I, that came out this past year. I have to send you. It's pretty, pretty nice. So, so if the second person hasn't started, you know, go ahead and switch over, and so both people get a chance.
what are you guys thinking about? Mm-hmm. So like a full body, a full car model with all four wheels, all suspension in each one. Yeah. Yeah, that's manageable. And that one's been done by lots of other people, so you've got a lot of resources to sort of, sort of get ideas about how to do it. Uh, in this class, we don't focus on control so much, but in your project, you're welcome to take that further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a, if you've already got the control stuff under your belt, for sure. Yeah. Well, we can we can figure out how to get it scoped well. You know, you'll have to come and chat and talk about some of the details. Once it, well, after I read your proposals, it'll be a good time to to do that. Hello. Oh, and what centrifugal G-force machines? Yeah. I say oh, this is <clears throat> no, centrifugal. I I probably do too, but uh, I may say both. But uh, um, you know, we have one here on campus. You should model the one that exists on campus. So, out by the airport, there's the Geotechnical Center. And we have a centrifuge there that can get up to, forget the G's on it, it's something like just an insane amount of G's. And they pack soil in it, in these containers with all these sensors, and um, simulate uh, earthquake and, 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 and seismic activity in the centrifuge. So, they can get the G's up to, you should. Yeah, they'll, it depends on the study. They Sometimes they put uh, just different types of uh, soil and rock structures in it, and sometimes they put um, buildings on top also. And they can shake the platform laterally while it spins, I think, too. So it's pretty cool. And it's big, and it's one of the most impressive facilities we have on campus. So you should go visit this. You, they'll give you a tour. Maybe, maybe I could get a tour for this class. That would be fun. Yeah, I know the guy. Um, I'll, I'll inquire. That could be fun to go check out because it's a. Mm -hmm. To do, to analyze or think about. Yeah. Well, maybe um, you certainly should contact them and uh, maybe they could tell you. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, no, it has nothing to do with the airport. It's just near it. Um, but it, if you just look up UC Davis Geotechnical Centrifuge, you know, you, I think you'll, you'll hit their website. But we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, maybe we can arrange something. We'll see. <laughs> All right, anybody want to tell me br briefly what, uh, what their neighbor said? What their neighbor's thinking about? Anybody want to, you don't have to tell about yourself, you just have to tell about your neighbor. Anybody want to share with the class? Yep. Uh, he spent most of the time talking about the movement of the leg, specifically causes of ACL injuries. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're running and you come to a sudden stop, there's a lot of forces. I think I should do this too. Well, the, the one, Holly that's listening, she can't hear, uh, can't hear uh, you all speak. Basically looking at Leg and oh, how she can at least. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> how uh, sports, I guess, events or injuries are, how, how you can, uh, I guess, model the leg as it undergoes a kind of strain that's associated with uh, an ACL injury. Okay. It has to do with bending, and, you know, between the different portions of the leg and how the forces interact with the structure and cause. Cool. Yeah, that sounds very appropriate. Um, and uh, we ha and you'll learn the tools to be able to investigate a lot of that. Although the uh, flexible tissues and the um, muscle activation and different things are, are, you know, there's other pieces of the puzzle there that may be needed too. But that'll be fun to check into. How about somebody else? Want to share what their neighbor said? I'm going to point at people, but I'm going to volunteer. 
I'd rather go with chance. <laughs> Let's hear from this table. When do you when do you share what your neighbor said? Um, my neighbor said that uh, he wants to do something with um, a human food and knife. Also, like so, we get a couple of people interested in. Okay. What and what did you get a question they might be interested in learning? So, what forces they need to jump? Is that the the avenue of thought there? Like what what he might want to answer with this this uh, model of the leg and foot? Um, you can help her if you want. <laughs> Power. Look, look, looking at the power in the joint or something. Okay. And, and I meant to say, what's your name? Too? Um, my name is Nama. <coughs> Nama. 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 Yes. And yours was again? Josh. Josh. Okay. Okay. Any, last, any other folks want to share? Okay. Well, let's move on. Um, I think that, that was uh, get you get you thinking about that a bit and. Um, for now, the uh, deadline is Monday, but I'm going to think about today whether that that is sufficient. I, I'm, um, okay. All right. So, last time we talked about angular velocity. We talked about simple angular velocity, and um, started putting together like what the how do we take derivatives of um, vectors in different reference frames. And additionally, we uh, found this nice theorem that says that if I want to know the derivative of a vector with respect to time in one reference frame, then if I know its angular, the, the um, angular orientation of a, a reference frame that vector is fixed in, um, sorry, the angular velocity that that uh, vector is fixed in, then I can have a very nice little relationship that says that if I have d of some vector v dt in A, and I happen to know its velocity in B, then all I have to do is add omega of B in A crossed with V, right? So this is a very useful theorem that we will continue to use here. Um, I want to start today with um, thinking a bit about, let me do this on a different page here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can we also get a matrix somewhere for like pole of velocity? A matrix? I'm not following completely there. So, like. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Can I say it again? You know what I mean? Like, if we, if we know the velocity, um, like in one frame, can we have a matrix that just transforms that velocity from that frame to another? The. This basically can this be expressed in uh, in terms of matrices? So each of the vectors that we have up there, v and omega, um, you could express them in a particular frame, and then they have three measure numbers, right? You can put those three ne measure numbers in a vector, and I can if I keep track of the frames, I can do I can do that cross product, so I'll get a cross product of two vectors here, 
and then a vector here. It's still only a three by one, both of those operations. So it's not, I don't think it's, there's a transformation per se that you could, uh, I mean, <clears throat> to do that, to do the, to do the derivative, um, I don't, I don't think so, but uh, let me mull on that some more. Maybe, maybe there is. <clears throat> um, okay, so back to this new page here. So, if you recall, I, I wrote, um, I wrote Euler's equations. on the first day of class, I believe. And if you recall this from Dynamics 101, this is sort of the rotational corollary um, of Newton's second law. So I have the sum of all the moments, or torques, about C equals to the time derivative of the angular momentum about C. Okay? So that's equivalent to sum of all the forces is equal to the time derivative of the linear momentum. Right? But for, for angular orientation. And um, in general, H C, the angular momentum, is, I can make this bigger. Um, let me uh, say, too, that C here is going to stand for the central angular momentum. So any given rigid body, there's a centroid, right, a center of that with respect to its mass. And C is going to represent the, uh, the angular momentum with respect to that point C. I guess for that to be correct. H of C is the central angular, angular momentum. And if um, the body in question is symmetric, then there, there are three principal moments of inertia. I1, oops, oops. I need to put this tablet mode. I1, I2, and I3. All right? In, in general, there's um, more moments of inertia and products um, with addition to products, products of inertia, and we'll talk about that as we get into that subject. But um, if you think of a, um, I don't know why I keep hitting all this stuff. If you think of, uh, H of HC expressed in um, the reference frame B, which is fixed to the body, or which is um, to rigid body B, then you can write HC. Turns out that um, the uh, angular momentum looks a lot like this. Okay, so this is like this is called body fixed express, right? So I have a body B, I have these uh, mutually perpendicular unit vectors fixed in B, and if I only have principal moments of inertia, then I can just multiply the uh, scalar value of omega. So I need to write omega. Also, omega B in. We'll use n for some inertial frame. It 
is omega-1 B1 plus omega-2 B2 plus omega-3 B3. All right, so those are the measure numbers, body fixed measure numbers of the angular velocity of B and N. And it turns out that then if the body is symmetric and there's only principal moments of inertia, um, and these axes are lined, aligned with the principal, mo principal axes, then we can write this like that. Okay? And let me note that too. B1, B2, and B3 um, are principal axes. Does everybody remember what moments of inertia are and the, what principal axes are? shouldn't be a hat. Sorry. Yeah. Catch my errors. I'm, I'm uh, sloppier than I probably should be as a... Okay, so principal axes. We've got three principal moments of inertia. And then you can write the angular momentum vector, which is a lot like, you know, mass times velocity, linear velocity. But this is I inertia about the B1 axis times the scalar um, uh, measure number of the omega B and N. Right? So we can watch write H of C that way. Um, if you want to generate then Euler's equations, I was going to switch over to SymPy and sort of show this and a few things with respect to that equation. Did everybody get that? Anybody not have this? Equation written down now. Those two equations. All right, so I'm going to open up a new notebook. And I'm going to do my standard here. And then I'm going to turn on the um, printing. And all should work. And then let's get some scalar values here. Um, I'm, going to call, I'm going to say I1, I2, and I3 equals I1, I2, I3 equals, these are, these are just um, constant values, so we can use symbols. And I'll show you a shorthand here. If I do 1 to 4, and the reason it's 4 is because uh, in Python this, this notation doesn't, um, isn't inclusive, right? then I can generate I1, I2, and I3. Type error. Spelled this wrong up here. Pretty print. Okay. All right. I1, I1, 2, I2, and I3. But omega... Right? They, it does vary with time. So here I'll do W1, W2, W3 equals ME dot dynamic symbols. And then I'm going to use the keyword omega and also 1 to 4. And then W1, W2, W3. And um, that should have rendered as the proper symbol. Why didn't it? So I, I'm not sure why that didn't render without this, but I put an underscore there. And now I get these omegas. And, and this is one key thing, too, is right. I can make my symbol names be different than what 
whatever variable I use in Python, right? Python doesn't have all these fancy mathematical symbols necessarily, but I can, I can do that. So now um, we could create some of these vectors. But let's go ahead and create some reference frames first. So in is going to be this inertial frame. And then uh, B is the body fixed frame. So we'll call this the body fixed reference frame and the inertial reference frame, right? Something that's fixed to, um, you know, Earth that's not, not moving. And B is, is moving in it with this angular velocity vector. So I'm going to show first, remember that we did this orient command. So I could orient B with respect to N through a simple rotation about an axis through some variable. And I'm just going to pick one of these. And then the axes I'll pick as uh, N dot X. And then it automatically creates this direction cosine matrix. And then if you look, there is a angvel in method here. Get rid of some of this. And angvel in in will automatically compute, right? So we have a simple, ro simple rotation through these angles, and it gives me omega 1 dot in x as an automatically computed angular velocity. And here, if you want to use that. <clears throat> but um, we don't always know what the orientation is or even care. Um, but it will compute, you know, for any kind of orientation you set up, it will automatically compute that angular velocity. But in this case, I don't want to do that, right? I, uh, my problem statement didn't really have anything to do with any orientations. So I'm going to just, uh, let's just recreate these reference frames again. And if I call B dot angvel n of n, right, with respect to n, I get an error, right? There's, it says no connecting path found between B and N. So it doesn't know how to compute that velocity if I don't give, if I don't give it this orientation. Um, in, the, in this notation, right, this is equivalent to, if I uh, put the math in here, it's, um, And I've been using bar, not bore, bar. All right, omega of B and N. So in this case, we have, we have the frame B, and we ask for its angular velocity in N. So it's sort of backwards, but that, that represents that. OK, so we get an error there. I'm just going to comment that out. And um, No direction cosine matrix. But there's also a um, B dot set angular velocity. So I can ex just explicitly set this if I want. If I don't know what the orientation is, but I do know what the angular velocity, it takes some frame, right, that I want to say that there has a velocity in, and then I give it a value. And that value is a vector. So if I want to set the body fixed angular orientation, and you can check out the help there. Um, then I can just do B dot set angular velocity in N, right, is going to be this thing, W1 times B dot X, right, it's body fixed, we're expressing it in the frame that's fixed to B, omega 2 times B dot Y plus omega 3 times 
b dot z. Right? So that's the, that's the expression that I wrote on the board. And then if I ask for angle velocity in n, I get, I, get, I get that vector right, that we just created. Okay? So that's the, that's the angular velocity, body fixed angular velocity, arbitrary body fixed angular velocity of this body b in n expressed in the B-frame, right, these principal axes. And I also, um, you know, there was this HC, just say HC, and we'll create that vector too. HC is I1 times omega1 times B dot X plus I2 times omega2 times B dot Y plus I3 times B dot Z sorry, omega-3 times b dot z. And then if I print that vector to the screen, right, that's what I, I don't know why my, um, usually the, they automatically do subscripts without having to put that underscore. Oh, I know what it is. My notation is wrong. So back, back up here, you don't need those curly braces. That was the problem. I was thinking wrong. All you have to do is type some variable name with, with the number, colon, number after it to generate multiple values in one, one little shot. And then it does the subscripts properly. Okay, sorry about that. So going back through here, um, back down to the bottom. There we go. All right, now I've got the central angular momentum vector. Um, if, the, if the thing is symmetric, we get this about the principal axes and the angular velocity vector. So if you recall, I um, said that the sum of the moments equals the time derivative of, of that vector, h of c. Okay? And if you recall, let me jump back to the screen so I can write it, any um, d h c d t in n what's how can I write this in terms of uh, the formula that theorem that I showed you that related the angular velocity of a body b to the differentiation of a vector that's in, in that expressed in body b Chris? Yeah. Right? So this is this is that a for me. We've got a, some vector. Time derivative of it in an n. Well, if if I know uh, information about this uh, rotation of b and n, angular velocity of b and n, then I can I can write this expression. And h of c goes here, goes here, right? So taking the time derivative of h of c dt in b should be pretty easy, right? And then we have to do that cross product. So if I jump back here, I can um, say, well, h of c dot dt and n. I'm sorry, b, right? h of c dot dt and b, right? It, it's just this, you know, all I have to do is differentiate each scalar with respect to time. So I get mega 1 dot, mega 2 dot, mega 3 dot. And then that cross product term, uh, we had we have omega of b in n, right? That's that vector. And then I'll just use the function here, me dot cross, right? Two vectors. So we cross this vector with h of c, which we defined, and it ought, it does that cross product for us, right? And so I get these uh, something expressed in the body fixed frame, but with these more complex measure numbers which result from the cross product of 
h of c and omega of b and n. So if I want to put things all together here, um, I could say something like uh, Simpy has a, a little way you can sort of write equations. Um, if I do sm dot matrix, uh, now what do I want? I want uh, just a symbol, and I'll call it m c comma, and then I put this expression h c dot d t of b. plus me dot cross b dot ang, ang velocity in n crossed with hc. I know I got all my parentheses right. Yeah. Let's just take away that stuff first, make sure this works. So that works. I think it didn't like, yeah, the, the thing I just tried may not work. But anyways, that, that's, that's now equal to the sum of the moments about the centro centroid. This, all right, so that's, that's our vector. And notice that. Um, I'll call this, let me just copy it. Oops. Copy base. So I'll stick, call this MC, right, the sum of the sum of the moments. And then um Recall that uh, any vector has this two matrix form. And I can sort of get the vec sort of a vector expression here of just the measure numbers. So we've got I1 omega 1 dot, I2 omega 1 dot, I3 omega 1 dot, and then these um, other terms sort of follow this pattern. It's I3 minus I2 times omega 2, omega 3, etc. And these these are Euler's equations. All right? So now I'm going to add uh, to that SM dot EQ so it sort of looks correctly. And then I can do SM dot matrix and then I'll do um, I'll do SM dot symbols M one to four I think that'll work. Missing a parenthesis. Why doesn't it like this? That and that. Okay, there we go. So these are the measure numbers of all the, the sums of all the moments acting at C. And then the uh, expression for the time derivative of the angular momentum about C. The, these, this is Euler's equations. Okay? So that... Um, just note that there. Yeah. So anytime you have a vector, we haven't done this yet, but I can, we'll do it today, um, potentially. I, I don't have to have them all expressed in B, right? I could have this thing in bx plus something in ax plus something in dx, right? And if you want to convert to a matrix, a matrix has no longer has any information about reference frames. This has complete information about all the reference frames involved. And you can express them in whatever references frames you want in any combination of, in a vector. 
So anytime I convert to a vector, or a matrix in this case, um, the reason we use the word matrix is just because uh, there's only matrices in SymPy that, uh, so that let's just call it a matrix. Like I created a column matrix here for the left-hand side. But I have to say what frame I want this, this um, column. I'm going to get screwed up. Under, I've been calling these vectors. This is, let's call this a column matrix. I'm going to have to say what frame it is so that it can re-express my vector in the terms of that frame and then pull off the measure numbers. All right. I could show that really, real quickly, I guess. <clears throat> For example, I could write, say I write some vector v equals omega 1 times n dot x plus omega 2 times b dot y. All right, I can write a vector like that, too. And then I would have to use v dot express in b if I wanted it all in b, or, or n if I wanted it all in n. And then I could pull off the three measure numbers and populate some kind of column, column matrix. This won't work right now, though. Does anybody know why that would throw an error? We don't have a DCM, right? So you have to have that orientation defined if you want to be able to re-express vectors like that. Next question, is it good practice then to develop a DCM for all of your reference types at the very start of any module that you're going to code? Yeah, typically there's a flow to these things. And you'll see like every problem I do will, will follow like a same pattern. And I usually start with angular orientation definitions. And then um, angular velocities probably next. Uh, well, ang angular orientations for sure first. So I always set up those angular orientations to reference frames. And that sort of defines any orientation specifications you need. And then when you, you want to hit these kind of errors as you move forward. So I usually do that. And uh, when we get to sort of full problems, you'll see the pattern that I follow. And, there, and there's, there's an order that uh, I mean, you could do it all mixed up as long as it's inherently ordered, but I usually do um, angular stuff, uh, orientation and velocities, and then linear positions and velocities. And then I uh, move on to then I do constraints, and then I do, um, and then I move on to defining the inertias and, and masses, and then forces and torques. And then finally, you got all the pieces of the puzzle to get the equations of motion. And uh, and so we we're. We're going to move into linear stuff, linear positions and things today, and um, to add another step to that. And, and it'll basically the order that we've, we learn the things, we'll, fo we'll follow them. OK? OK, so that, that's Euler's equations. And I wanted to show, is there one more thing here? I think that covered it all. OK, any question, other questions on that? All right. Where are we at? Ten. Okay, let's come back to drawing on this thing and uh, come to a new page. And I and I want to talk about. We'll talk about this figure. Um, where's my figure? This one. Figure two point four one in the book. And I'm going to erase this from up here since it's already in your notes and I want to use the space. <clears throat> so we're going to talk now about um, something called auxiliary reference frames. And in general, you have reference frames fixed to rigid bodies. And those are the, you know, the main reference frames that have to be there. Uh, but sometimes it's useful to introduce what are called auxiliary reference frames that simplify uh, being able to express um, vectors, the vectors of interest of a particular problem. So this um, figure here shows a cone that 
is oriented in space with, re with respect to A, which is like an inertial reference frame there. <clears throat> and the figure is not the clearest, but um, you imagine a cone, and it's got some orientation. And you see three um, scalars here, Q1, 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 Q2, Q3, that are going to orient that one rigid body um, completely with respect to B, A, okay? And the cone is called body B. So just to explain this a little, let me grab a, some different colors here. Oops. Um, so the first rotation, if we look at reference frame A, um, this... is fixed in A, and this is fixed in A, right? And then I, uh, come on. If we rotate through Q1, I'm going to call this reference frame A1 a new auxiliary reference frame that uh, is rotated through Q1 with respect to A, okay? So that's the first, first rotation. And then um, the next angle, Q2, is this angle with respect to um, this vertical, the, the vertical line L2 to this vertical, to this line L3. And L3 goes down the, the axis of symmetry of the cone. Okay, so L3 is the axis of symmetry of the cone. And, you know, it's, it's more or less, you know, goes through the cone and out the other end. All right, so that's the uh, axis of symmetry of the cone. And we could define then a new reference frame here, and I'll sort of give it a unit vector uh, there, and then a unit vector here. And it would have the third one sort of pointing I like this a little bit. All right? So this we'll call A2, All right? And that, I now rotate about this unit vector K7 through Q2, right-hand right rule about K7 through Q2, and puts the angle relative to that, okay? And then the, ver and then the last one is... Um, Get a new color here, purple. The last one is body B. All right, so if I rotate through Q3 rel relative to that line L5, then I get um, and this is a rotation about L3, so, there, so this is also aligned here. And then we'd see another one pop out here somewhere. So the purple is fixed to B, right? Does anybody have any questions about how that works? Right, so we rotate about K2 through Q1, and we got an auxiliary reference frame A1. And then we rotate about K7 through Q2 to get this new reference frame um, A2. And then finally, B 
is rotated about K3 through Q3 to get the body fixed coordinates there. Any questions? Does everybody see that? Is that clear? So what we've done is introduced A1 and A2 here. And they're going to help us out. Um, figuring out what the angular velocity of B is, is with respect to A. So what time we got? 10.55. Let's we'll hold it there, take five minutes, get a sip of water, stretch, and um, think about that drawing, and then, and then we'll move on. Um, K vectors, we're going to we'll call them they're your unit vectors aligned with those particular lines, right? And this is uh, right. Okay. So now we have that that, that figure down, Pat. Um, this idea of auxiliary reference frames. quite useful um, with respect to just underline that with respect to angular velocity so just as a formal definition here reference frames between two other frames whose orientation and angular velocities um, reference frames between two other frames whose orientation and angular velocities we want. Okay? Um, through a sequence of simple rotations we build or create the angular velocity of the outside frames using what's called the addition theorem. Okay? And the addition theorem looks like this. Omega of B and A, right, just like we've got on the diagram, equals the omega of A1 with respect to A plus omega of A2 with respect to A1 plus dot 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 omega of A in with respect to A in minus 1 plus omega of B with respect to A in the last one. Okay? So that's for in um, auxiliary reference frames. Okay, this is the addition theorem. And that's very convenient and helpful uh, when we have sort of special like a system that I've just shown. And it's particularly useful when each of those omegas are simple rotations. Okay? Uh, because that gives us some simplicity. A couple other little details here. Um, omega of B and A is simply the negative of A and B. And um, yeah, 
That's it. Any questions there? So I'm going to create a new page. I'd really like to bring this figure with me. Lasso select. Let's see if we can do that. Um, copy. Add page. <coughs> Didn't get everything. Maybe it's easier to uh, copy the page. This is the one I want. Copy that one now. Paste. All right. And erase all this. Okay, got the figure back. So for our particular figure, um, I'm going to pin uh, omega of B and A, then, with this addition theorem, will simply be omega of A2 with respect to A1 with respect to A, right, plus omega of A2 with respect to A1, plus omega of B with respect to A2. Okay, two auxiliary reference frames. And all these were simple rotations, so that's quite nice. We can just say Q1 dot, K2 is the first vector there, plus Q2 dot, K7, plus Q3 dot, K3. All right. So simple rotations make those very easy to write. Um, and they're expressed with respect to those k vectors there. Now, omega is a, um, is a vector, omega of a and b. So we can take the derivative of that to also get a alpha of b and a, right? Some kind of angular acceleration variable. Vector, angular acceleration vector. And alpha of B and A equals the time derivative in A of omega of B and A. Right? That's the definition. We can use our uh, new favorite formula and say that the omega of B and A in A dt equals d omega b in A in B with respect to dt plus omega b crossed with what? What do I cross it with? Same thing we did with the angular momentum vector, h. Omega b and a, right? Right, so it's, that's the vector. Now what's omega b and a cross omega b and a? I think I heard it. Zero. Zero. So this is true. The time derivative of omega b and a in a equals the time derivative of b and a in b. All right. So that's very useful. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's all you have to do to get the angular acceleration. Right? So all this is equal to alpha of b and a. So thinking about the cone here, um, I'll start over here. The uh, alpha of b and a equals the time derivative in a dt of our q1 dot k2 dot k2 hat plus q2 dot k7 hat plus q3 dot k3 hat. And if we expand that, I do have some room here. If we expand that out, we're going to get um, using our right. Both both of these things change in time. All all six of these terms, the vectors and the scalars. So we've got to use the product product rule. We'll get q1 double dot k2 plus q1 dot time derivative of uh, k2 hat in a plus q2 double dot k7 q2 dot dk7 a dt plus q3 double dot k3 plus q3 dot k, sorry, dk3 dt. In a. All right, so that's the product rule. It expands that. So we got all these terms, no parenthesis there, to deal with. So to start, um, what's the time derivative of k2 in a, this term? Jesus Christ. There we go. <laughs> um, well, that's what I get for try trying new, new technology crashed one note. Let's see if it anything is there if I close it. I'll even close. Come on. So <clears throat> let me just write this up here instead of goofing around. So we had uh, that alpha of B in A equals um, this big thing, q1 double dot k2 hat plus q1 dot d a k2 dt plus q double dot k7 plus uh, q2 dot D A K two sorry K seven D T plus uh, Q three double dot K three plus Q three dot D K three D T. Right. So what was what's that? Time derivative of k2 in a. Let me and I'll try to open this. Uh, we'll do my favorite solution in Windows. Restart. 
Um, <clears throat> I could probably switch to here. Duncan. Time derivative of K2 in, in for reference frame A. Sorry. Yeah, question mark. What is this? This is this one goes to zero, right? K2 is fixed in A. It's just a rotation axis. And then um, these two, right, we can write uh, out, like, what is that going to be? D K7 hat in A DT. Well, K7 is moving, can be, you know, is a, is a function of the scalars with respect to um, a, only Q1, but uh, if you recall, right, this equals to omega of B and A crossed with K7. And omega B and A, I'm sorry, that's not what I wanted. I think I had, did I have A2 here on my other? Drawing. Let's swap those A1 and A2. Um, I want to say uh, A1 and A with respect to that figure there. All right? And then Omega A1 and A is this simple uh, Q1 dot K2 cross now with K7. Do, do that one on your piece of paper. Somebody want to tell me what that one is? Chris? K3 is fixed in B and in A2. And so this, <coughs> this, this thing is the time derivative of K3 dt in A1, right? And that, uh, I'm not sure that's exactly right. If you think about that uh, K3 is fixed in A2 and B, and B um, 
then the time derivative of uh, k3 can be written like, so let's see, we'll see if this works out. I'll write it like I did it. A k3 dt omega of b and a crossed with k3 and and then if you just plug in our q1 dot k2 k2 plus q2 dot k7 plus q3 dot k3 and all of that crossed with k3. <clears throat> k3 cost of k3, those are going to go, that one's going to go away. And then we only have to write out the first here. So q1 dot q2 crossed with k3 plus q2 dot k7 crossed with k3. And then if we write out yours, we get um, omega of A1 and A is Q1 dot K2 crossed with A2 and A1 is uh, Q2 dot K Q2 dot K7 crossed with K3. Oh. So here you get you will get Q1 dot Q2 dot K2 cross with K7. Which is an extra term in yours, I think. Is that right? Q1 dot K2 cross Q1 dot Q2 dot cross K2 cross K7 and Q1 dot K2 cross with K3. So you've got this term, but you I think you're adding an extra. Yeah, I don't think that's quite right. We're, you're going to examine that later, but <clears throat> this is that this is that der that derivative, right? So we knew what omega a, b, and a was, and k. We can write that out. All right. I'm going to come. Where are we at? 11:25. Let's come back to the laptop. It's now fired up again. And. <clears throat> Uh, we've got this, that's zero, we calculated both of those, these we just copy over, and we can write out then the whole um, alpha here. So then I can write um, alpha of B and A is then going to end up equaling K2 double dot Sorry, K1, K2, plus Q double dot 2, K7, plus Q2 dot Q1, K2, cross K7, Q1 dot Q2. Were you, were you adding in... That extra term? No? I don't know. I'll have to come back to that after, after later. Q1 dot uh, plus Q3 double dot K3 plus Q3 dot Q1 dot K2 crossed K3 plus Q2 dot K7 crossed K7. 
okay, three. All right, so that is sort of nasty and long. Okay, so taking these derivatives, um, we have to be very careful. All right, so our angular acceleration of B and A of that cone, which is just defined by these three coordinates, ends up being this rather complex expression. And it's key to note that alpha B and A does not, in general, equal alpha A1 and A plus alpha A2 and A1 plus alpha B and A2, right? So that's key, right? We see some of those terms that you might think, right? There's the alpha A1 and A, alpha A2 and A, and alpha B and A2, but we've got these other cross product terms that you have to keep track of there. Okay, so the addition theorem for angular velocities works for us in a very nice way, but you don't get that advantage at the acceleration level. Um, you have to do your derivatives and keep track of those. Okay? Any, any questions there? Sorry about the technical, technical mishap. Supposed to be a hat. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, <clears throat> yeah, you're right. I'm a. Uh, I'm a sloppy dynamicist. Q one dot. This one. All right, I think I think that's right now. Double dot, dot dot, double dot. Okay. So yeah, that's the important aspect. So you can use this addition theorem on the angular velocities, but not on the angular accelerations. And um, and I'll go ahead and point out too that oh yeah, I don't have. Uh, Just like there's the ang velocity in and ang velocity in um, set angular velocity in the notebook in the um, in simpy here. If I if I do, we had um, b dot ang xl in. In, right, it'll calculate the angular acceleration of B and N automatically for you, for you there. And you can you can also set that to some specific specific thing to set angular acceleration of the frame in some specific vector if you, if you need to set it explicitly. All right, so those those are the corollaries there. Now, so we, so now we know about angular velocities of two of reference frames and angular accelerations, and how to take derivatives of these angular velocity vectors to get the angular acceleration. Any questions? So that that concludes sort of everything. Um, about the kinematics associated with orientation, angular velocity of a reference frame, a rigid body, and angular acceleration of a reference frame, rigid body. And we don't need anything beyond ex angular acceleration because uh, of Euler's equations and Newton's second law. Okay, so that's the far farthest derivative that you have to take to, f to form those equations, but. Uh, there are use, uses for higher derivatives of these things too, which would follow the same same pattern and rules. Questions? So we got 20 more minutes. Let's uh, get started into now linear 
And I'll, I'll go ahead and start a new page. So now, um, so now we want to talk about <clears throat> points. Okay, so a given point in space is going to have some linear velocity and acceleration, and that's going to be useful also for formulating. Um, Newton's laws and Euler's equations. The um, so the velocity and acceleration of points. So here I'm going to let p bar equal the position vector. From any point O. fixed in reference frame A to a point P moving in A. Okay, so point P is moving in A. And then the position vector I'm going to define as um, a vector from some other point O that's fixed in A to the point P. And then we can define the velocity vector of P, point P, in reference frame A as the time derivative of the vector P bar in A. And then also the acceleration of point P in A equals the time derivative of the velocity of P and A in A. So that, we find those as such. And, um, Let's look at an example. Go ahead and go to a new page. Insert picture. Okay, so this this figure. As a plane, right? We have reference frame A, which is the sort of background, and then we have this body B, this plane that is rotated through omega t. So this is an angle omega t, implying that it's a constant angular rotation. My shoe will not stay tied. And we have two points in it, P1 and P2. Right, P1 and P2 are moving or in that plane. And then we have a point O here that's fixed in A at this position. Right? And this is BX, BY, BZ. So with this figure in mind, then let's write, um, first of all, the position vector of P1 um, with respect to O. We'll call that um, from O to P1. And I'll also mention that um, you'll see this notation too, um, a position vector R of P1 with respect to O. Alt notation. I'll save, save some writing though right now. So uh, 
vector P1 is then Q1 Bx plus Q2 By, right? A position. We have those two scalar measure numbers, measure, scalar no, measure numbers, Q1 and Q2. And we want to keep in mind, too, that omega of B and A equals simply omega about By. Constant rotation there. And then we can also write um, P2 from O is P1 plus L E X hat. Right? So E X, E Y, and E Z, I can go to P1 and then add the vector to P2. And there's a relationship between the E's and the B's. So BX equals EX. I'll uh, use shorthand notation here. C3 minus EY S3. BY equals EX S3 plus EY C3, cosine of 3. Right? We just have a simple rotation about BZ equals EZ. Right there. So you could then express, um, you know, P. One, for example, in terms of uh, in terms of these, right? Q one bx Q two times by Okay. Now let's uh, take. Let's take some derivatives. Um, if I want to know then the velocity of P1 in A, right, remember it's the time derivative of this vector P1 in A. And then you can write that though as um, dP1 and B dt plus omega of B and A crossed P1. What's the time derivative of P1 with respect to dt, I mean, with respect to time, time derivative of P1 with, uh, with respect to the B frame, this first term? That first first term there be time derivative of p one the vector p one which I should add that to the drawing this is vector p one what's the time derivative of p one in, in reference frame B. So the point P1 is, is in that plane, but it could be moving. Um, Q1 and Q2 can change with time. So the time derivative of P1 
in the B frame. So if I'm standing in the B frame and looking at P1, standing on O, right, on the B frame, looking at P1, how could, what, what's, uh, we have P1 already written in the B frame up here. P1 equals Q1 BX plus Q2 BY. And if I want to take the derivative of some vector in a particular reference frame, and it's expressed in that reference frame, what do I do? Everybody's ready to leave. Chat with your neighbor about this and see if they might know. Not hearing any chatting, or very little of it. Talk to your neighbor? No idea. Do you recall how to take a derivative of a vector? Chain rule? Chain rule is if you have um, sort of a function of a, if you had, yeah, cha chain rule could be applied. What is the time derivative of bx in b? Zero. Time. I think so. Yep. So if you were to apply the chain rule and did, you know, you'd have q1 dot times bx plus Q1 times BX dot. But what's BX dot in B? Time derivative of BX. If I'm standing in B looking at the unit vector BX, does it change in time? No. So that would be zero. Anybody got an answer here? So what about this? Does this, anybody get that? So 
if I explicitly apply the chain rule to P1, I have to take the time derivative of the first part times the second component, and then I have to also do, um, I'm sorry, this is the, the chain rule, the product rule, to, to, expand the, you know, to expand the derivative of those two terms. Dot, dot on the by. Got a number of things, right? Okay, so that. <clears throat> now, what is the time derivative of bx in b? So that term is zero. What's the time derivative of by in b? All right. So that's all that we're left with. And if you recall, the definition of taking a time derivative of a vector, if that vector is expressed in the frame that I want the, the uh, time derivative in, all I have to do is dot the measure numbers. Okay? So all I have to do is just dot the measure numbers. Q1 dot, Q2 dot. And then omega of B, A and B is right here. So that's just omega B, Y crossed with P1. And P1 is Q1 B, X plus Q2 B, Y. B, Y crossed with B, Y is what? Speak up. Zero. So I only have to do this first bit right there. And then if I look at x crossed into y, so bx, the right-hand rule, crossed into by is what? <coughs> bz. So this is just going to be omega q1 bz. Right? So that's the velocity of P1 in A. We used our faithful, faithful theorem here. Took that simple time derivative of P1 and B. Got these two terms and then did our cross product, which is pretty simple. So if you think about this, right, if this thing is rotating, um, this frame B, the velocity vector of that point is always going to be just pointing per, per, uh, perpendicular to the plane, normal to the plane. There. So it's rotating around that plane, that velocity vector is going to always be perpendicular. So it'd be something like this, and then that's perpendicular to the plane. Horrible, horrible arrow, but perpendicular to the plane. And that's V, P1, and A. Okay, that's what I got for you today. It's 11.50, and um, we'll move on to more and more derivatives next time. Oh, yeah, B, B, Y into X is negative. Thank you. Negative. Thank you. So by into bx points in the negative bz direction. Okay? All right. Thank you.